Good morning, this is Leandra Clark. I am a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I am at the ABCI 40th Convention and I'm interviewing Dr. Wade Nobles. Good morning, Dr. Nobles. Good morning. Well, first I'd like to start off by uh, learning a little bit about your history. Tell me about your background, where you're from, where you grew up. My background, I am uh, the son of John Nobles, who was born in 1900 who was the son of Mims Nobles, who was born in 1836, who was the son of Wade Nobles, who was born in 1860. Wow. So I believe I am the reincarnation of the Wade Nobles, who was born in 1860. Hmm. And I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. And the year I was born, my mother went to work as a maid at the mental health hospital in Mattapan, Massachusetts. And all my early life, she came home telling us about, telling my brother and I about these crazy white doctors at the psychiatric hospital mm. and, the, and how they didn't understand uh, the behaviors of black people. And so I think I was bred to be a black psychologist from birth. Wow. So it sounds like your mother was a heavy influence early on in your life as far as um, determining kind of where your, your career went. Actually, my mother, when I told my mother that uh, I wanted to be a psychologist after I finished high school, she had a little concern and she asked me to be sure I could get a job that was paid me a salary because <laughs> she didn't really understand what psychologists do mm -hmm. and uh, my mother had a seventh grade education mm -hmm. and my father had a third grade education and they are the ones who educated me I don't wow. think that uh, I learned much from my formal education that superseded the, the lessons I learned from my parents wow. so tell me about your formal education where did you go to school what kind of student were you I, well, in, actually in high school, I went to uh, almost all my high school in, in Boston. And, and in Boston, the, school, the city schools were segregated by gender. Mm. So I went to all boys school. Mm. And then my senior year, I, my action, when my father uh, transitioned, my mother decided she wanted to get as far away from Boston as she could. And because things were literally falling apart. And uh, she had a brother working in California. And so he told her to come to California, so she packed me up. I'm the baby in my family, so I was the last one that left at home. And so she packed me up and boxed up some chicken, and we got on a Greyhound bus, and we came to California. And I finished my, my uh, high school in California okay. uh, at Oakland High School. And that's an a integrated school in terms of males and females. So I, uh, my skills with, 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 with girls was really after school, and before school, but I, I never had an understanding of what you do with girls in the classroom because that was sort of strange to me. So I spent most of my senior year in the library because I was sort of retreating from uh, publicly letting people know that the only time I could deal with girls was at the bus stop or after school or before school. And they were bothersome to me in the classroom. They were a distraction. And, uh, and so I then found out that I had a love for reading because going into the library, just, I wouldn't just sit there, I found I had a love for reading. And as it turns out, as I'm thinking about it, I, I, I was attracted to ancient history. Hmm. Uh, and I just sort of read all the ancient history and all the Peloponnesian Wars and Greek stuff. And, and, uh, and that never really satisfied me because it, even at the, as a high school student, reading that, I was always wondering, where, you know, where were we? All, this, all these wonderful sagas going on and reading and intriguing, but I never saw it myself. And so I think that's when I started the quest for mm -hmm. trying to understand uh, where we were as African people in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I was on a path. Wow. So from high school, you went on to college and grad school? I went, to, but I, it, was, it was very good for us because we were, you know, I said, things were falling apart in my family in, okay. terms, of the, in terms of finances, et cetera. And uh, so coming to California, we were blessed to be able to go to junior college. So I went to mm. junior college, what well, was called a junior college. And, and, uh, and I began to uh, uh, study and, and, and my older brother and cousins sort of came out. And so we 
had almost a little compound of, mm -hmm. of people who were trying to go to school. Wow. And, um, and we did all kinds of wonderful things uh, to make that going to school work in terms of uh, uh, acquiring gasoline that we didn't pay for and, and stakes out of the Safeway that we borrowed and things mm -hmm. like that. But okay. It was a time when we were very creative in terms of making sure that we survived and that we got, went to school. And, from, and, and as I think about it, uh, it was in an environment where education and politics became very mm -hmm. melded because it was a time when we were at the, the height of the, you know, some would call it the, the black uh, political movement, but it really was a, a reawakening of who we were. But everybody, the, I mean, Oakland was a, was a very wonderful and exciting place. Uh, uh, the, the Panthers were, were emerging. Uh, the Nation of Islam was very strong. Uh, people were making critique of, of where we were, and there were you know, slogans of you know, community control and, and, uh, and, and, and self-reliance and, and having a responsibility mm -hmm. to take care of our own. So it was a rich, very rich environment to be a student in. Right. Because it wasn't about I'm going to school to get a job. It really was about I'm going to school to get the skills to mm -hmm. make history, to change the way the world is. So throughout that time as a student and considering the political climate, where were your so sources of support? You kind of talked about this cohort of people, your peers that were there to support yeah. you, but where were the where, what were the other supports? Well, I, I also I also got married during all the time. Okay. And uh, and my wife became my source of support. Mm -hmm. uh, she she and I both were working and uh, when I went to graduate school, uh, I should point out that I went to I went to San Francisco State. University, and I was one of those students who some people would record as the, the, the radical students who caused the strike, and we literally, in my senior year, caused the uh, university to to uh, recapitulate and to to critique itself about uh, uh, it not being a, a, an academic institution that provided a liberal education because there was no education for black people grounded in the interest of our historical record, and so so. We as black students of the Black Students Union uh, 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 made the university close itself down and, and, and uh, engaged in the longest student strike on record. And, and, and the university capitulated to our demands and established a, uh, a uh, black studies program. Mm -hmm. And then again, as a student, I was in the midst of people that were great people, uh, Nathan Ear, uh, came in and Sonia Sanchez and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Amir Baraka came in and we were all just sort of sitting in like a room like a table uh, struggling and talking about one a, a common enemy and kind of evolving the common destiny because mm -hmm. we while well, we talked about uh, having a black uh, studies program uh, it was mostly rooted in black history because that's what we knew uh, as being absent and uh, it almost simultaneously uh, as a student at San Francisco State, there were two, uh, two black psychologists, uh, <coughs> Joseph White, mm -hmm. uh, actually with three, Joseph White, Harold Dent, and um, uh, I'm blocking the other brother's name. But Joseph White is, is, is not more important, but, but Joseph White uh, uh, suggested that I, I uh, go and be a, a, a gopher at, at APA hmm. uh, and, and hand out, you know, leaflets and do stuff that students are told to do in, uh, in, in conferences and, that, and, and have an opportunity to see uh, the deliberations of APA. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went to APA, but uh, un, unbeknownst to Joseph, I um, had the strategy that I was going to go, make sure the people who were you know, signing us in, signed me in, and then I was going to leave because <laughs> it didn't make no sense. I just, I just want to get credit that I was there. So I get my extra credit points and I was going to leave and go back across the bank to Oakland and, and pick up my kids, talk to my wife, and you know, that kind of stuff. But as I was leaving out of the hotel in San Francisco, there were these three or four black psychologists um, at the, at, literally outside, outside of one of the, the lounges. And they were talking very angrily, and, and, and that drew me into what they were talking about. Because at San Francisco State, I had Joseph White and and a couple of people. I didn't, I didn't know that it was more than that. Mm -hmm. It turned out it, it, it turned out to be Bob Williams and oh. a couple of folk, and they were talking very angrily about stuff. And 
and, uh, and and I'm I'm coming out of a radicalized student tradition, right? And so uh, I I think I added something to the conversation about about us uh, uh, critiquing white psychology, and uh, and I was using the language of white psychology because that's what I saw a I saw psychology as I just see psychology as uh, this universal discipline that, that understood uh, the 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 function of all people, mm -hmm. and. Um, and even in my classes, I, I, I would sit in those classes at several school state with psychology classes, and um, and me and maybe one brother or me and nobody, black in the classroom. And as they gave their theories and their discussions, I would be shaking my head to say, "That's not how my mother functions. Hmm. That's not how my household functions." Mm -hmm. So I was always contrasting something missing in, in white psychology, and uh, came and had this idea: this is white people, white folk psychology. Say, our psychology, and then going to the APA, I knew I didn't want that because I had that sense. I didn't want to waste my time going to the workshops about white psychology because I'm not white, mm -hmm. and I was just excited and get out. And I saw these brothers and sisters, and they were talking about the you know not having uh, workshops and liberations that were relevant to black people, and that was that really resonated with me. Right. And so that someone called for let's go up to so and so's room and. And before you knew it, my, my memory of this history was that somebody ordered in some wine, and somebody ordered in some fried chicken, and we started <laughs> talking and debating, and, and people were talking at the time about, uh, about having a division of APA that would, be, would address the needs of black folk and forcing APA to sort of uh, uh, come to uh, uh, a respect for our special set of, of issues. And uh, then as a, as a student, I... I, I uh, Begin to argue in that session that we should not even be an APA, that we should uh, break away and have our own psychological association. And I think that was the ten of the time. There were a lot mm -hmm. of people talking about black organizations, again, you know, the, the open radicalization of community control and, and, and white folks are the enemy and we got to do this. So, so out of that sort of retreat that we had at APA, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of having an association of black psychology was born. And I tell my students now that uh, because of the, 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 in quote, accident of circumstance or, and or the prophecy of destiny, I became the baby father of Abyssine because uh, the, of the fathers of Abyssine. Right. I was the child, literally a child in terms of my mind now, mm -hmm. uh, of being at the place where we decided to create uh, the Association of Black Psychologists. And then Joseph gave, uh, me the encouragement to uh, go on to graduate school okay. and um, I knew I wanted to do that I had no idea about the mechanism mm -hmm. and uh, and those students and cousins with the little compound I was living mm -hmm. in I had a, a, a cousin who uh, named Fred Logan who said uh, what you got to do and that's how kids talk to each other he, he's like two years older than me so like he knows everything he said what you got to do <laughs> is pick out the top 10 best schools in psychology and apply to those top 10. Mm -hmm. And then if those top 10 don't work, and I tell my students the same thing right now, if those top 10 don't work, go to the next top 10. But also study what the top 10 said about you so you can make, you know, mm -hmm. keep refining yourself. So I did that, I did. I, sent, I applied to, top, to the top 10 schools and, I, um, and Stanford University accepted me uh, Michigan State accepted me in Cornell, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I have uh, I have a young wife and a, and a baby, and I said I don't want to go to no Midwest where it's cold, <laughs> and I don't want to go no East Coast where it's cold, and I don't know about the, what is where is the Stanford University at, and I'm living here in Oakland, and Stanford University is like 30 miles down the road, and so I said I think I'm gonna go to Stanford, and so I chose Stanford of the of, so I, my record is that. Of the ten, three accepted me and seven rejected me. But that ain't the, 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 the important part of the story. The important part of the story is that I chose Stanford not because it was the best, but because it wasn't cold in Palo Alto. <laughs> and uh, but but when I went to Stanford, I realized that Stanford was cold because Stanford was like hmm. Disneyland, mm -hmm. Hollywood, very 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 rich and powerful white folks who didn't understand anything about black people at all. And I uh, went into a program where Joseph actually rolled down to uh, Stanford with my letter of recommendation in his hand. 
in his beat up car. He had a beat up car and uh, and spoke to uh, the, the chairman of the department. And I, and I believe he, Joseph might have threatened him. I'm not sure that side of the story, but uh, <laughs> but uh, Joseph was very instrumental in uh, in uh, telling me and helping me to realize that uh, Stanford would be a place that I should go. And my own radicalization mm -hmm. uh, made me go to Stanford like a guerrilla warfare. I went there with the mindset that I was going into enemy territory and I had to get what was good and get out. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so, for, so day one, when I went to Stanford, I looked at their program and I studied it and it was essentially a four-year program. And I figured out that I could do this in three years. And so I proceeded day one to get through with my PhD in three years. And so the first year I got my master's, I got my master's from Stanford. And I did that because I said to myself, I may not be able to hold my breath long enough in this funky place, uh, so I better get my master's in case I decide to leave. And so I got my master's in one year, and then I got my PhD in uh, three years, and I was gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I came back to Stanford a couple of times uh, as a working professional psychologist, and I'm an experimental psychologist. I'm, I'm working in a mental health center doing mm -hmm. uh, research uh, here in San, in San Francisco. And I was actually invited back to Stanford to speak a couple of times, and there were students who were my cohort who were still playing around mm -hmm. at Stanford. But what I realized is that going to Stanford was nirvana for them. That was the end. That was the goal, mm -hmm. to be at Stanford. Right. And whereas my strategy was to get in and get the resources and get out. Mm -hmm. And so I, so, I, so I started seeing this and even differences in intentionality mm -hmm. about why people do what they do. Because getting radicalized, my, my job was to get the resources to engage in this war, this intellectual war, and to provide uh, uh, sources of information to my community. Whereas my white counterparts were just so happy to be at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. And one of the, when I said I hold my nose because it was a vulgar place, one of the things that Stanford did that I thought I think was really vulgar was that they had a requirement for all first year students to go to a four o'clock sherry hour. Sherry hour. And the sherry hours was where all the Stanford professors would walk around and puff up their chest and talk about how great they are and tell us that you are you are the best because we accepted you. Like that you know, they were like trying to anoint us. And uh, that was so, so abrasive to me because I said, first of all, what's the Sherry shit about? <laughs> I mean, why, why is Sherry? Why is Sherry? And then why do we get to walk around this room? And they, just, they literally just sort of paraded around like peacocks in this room, uh, talked about how great they were. And they would say, you know, Dr. So so you know, you're great. And he's like, oh, well, you're great too. And oh, you're great. And, and I said, this is so obscene. <laughs> this is so obscene up in here. But it was an intentional attempt at indoctrinating mm -hmm. uh, these first year students and not saying that what 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 uh, 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 Joe did but but also I had you know, good teachers at, at Sinclair Drake and and uh, uh, other teachers who who gave me the sense that the, the the best teacher wants his students to be better than him mm. and that your success is when your students are greater than you where these Stanford professors were saying, you are always going to have to bow down to me. And uh, so, I, I, so, so what, what's happened to me as I look at it and reflect back on it is that I'm being given all these dichotomies and all these contrasts about a field that, again, my mother introduced me to by talking, but you know, I'm, I'm born pre-television. Mm. So we didn't have television. I mean, I, I can remember as a child when television was invented and it was in the storefront windows and they'd have that test pattern almost 24 hours a day and in one 20 minute they'd have a program and we all those little black kids would stand out front of the, the store and look at this television with a test pattern on it and then wait for the show to come on which was like a little 15 minute show but but what my mother my mother and father did was that we didn't have television is they would tell us stories mm. and my mother would tell my mother's a little small woman right my mother's five feet well actually she's five feet tall my father's six foot four and they would tell us these stories about living in the south mm. and about really fighting the Ku Klux Klan mm. and my mother would tell, would tell this wonderful story about how her father um, her father uh, had 
13 children. Mm -hmm. And he taught all his children how to shoot guns. And her oldest brother went to town and he got accused of, this, this is everybody's, almost everybody's story, he got accused of looking too long at a white woman. And so the Ku Klux Klan decided they were going to go out to John Cotton's place and teach them niggas a lesson. And my father, how black folks did this, I don't know, but my father got wind of it and he got all his children to get their, their guns and his, hmm. and, his, and his mother. And houses were built up on stilts in, 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 in uh, Georgia. And so he told his children that he was going to go out and he, would, uh, he took a, 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 a knife and he went out while these white men were on these horses and they were drinking, getting their courage and shouting all these bad epitaphs to black people and how they're going to kill uh, my, my, uh, my mother's brother. And my father, my father said, when I give the signal, just start shooting, right, to all his children and his, and his mother. And his mother was, the mother was Park Street Native American, so we said that she was this, 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 uh, this, this warrior Indian. And so what my, father, my grandfather did is he crawled while these white men were, were uh, drinking on their horses. He crawled through the horses and he cut the tendon of the leg of each horse. He cut the tendon, the horse would just go, mm, the horse would just make a little noise. Mm. And the white folks would just think the horse has been uncomfortable. And then he gave this signal, and when he gave the signal, all my mother's brothers would start shooting out the, shooting out the windows at these white folks. And, uh, and my grandfather, my grandmother went out with this hatchet, and she started chopping these people. And this is a, this is, this is a wonderful story for me, for my, this is entertainment, <laughs> right? It's a wonderful story. But what, ha what happened is that the white folks that survived went back and said, don't uh, go out to the cotton place because that John Cotton is a crazy nigga. Mm -hmm. And they left, them, they left my family alone from then on. Now the lesson I learned there, the lesson I learned, I took with that, is that my grandfather had such a love for his family mm -hmm. that he literally crawled out on the ground and put himself in danger in order to protect his family. But he also prepared. He prepared, and so even my, my, my work style now is that I always over prepare, uh, and I always see myself as what is what what is the intention of this meeting? See, my grandfather said, "What's what's the, what's the goal here? The goal here is to save my family, mm -hmm. and the goal so it wasn't let me go out and you know, take my hat off and hope these white folks will forgive my son and and and, and plead my case. The goal was that I'm not going to allow you to hurt my family. I'm going to protect my family, and that has been sort of my. And that's, that's embedded in my, in my mm -hmm. very soul, that, that there's nothing I will not do to protect my family, including putting my own life in danger. Mm -hmm. I, I got that from John Cotton. And, uh, and so he becomes a, a, a prototype hero for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, remember, I remember as a child, it turns out he and I both were born on June 6th, so I said so I love this because now we had the same birthday. And when, when I would go as a, as a grown man, literally married man, and, my grandfather came to California once to see us, and uh, I can remember just sitting in the, on the couch beside him and feeling so special because I was just sitting beside him. That's the psychology that you, I, I wasn't getting in, in, in school. So there's, there's something about the dynamic of black life mm -hmm. that we have to see as the, as the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the database mm -hmm. for us as black psychologists, understanding what these dynamics are, because here you have uh, absolutely vulgar oppression, dehumanization, and you got this love of family mm -hmm. and this protection of family uh, that inspires young people, children, to see themselves as having a mission and a destiny in life. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Nobles, you talk so much about kind of your own resiliency through um, growing up, the resiliency of your family, and also the resiliency um, through graduate school. Um, so what happened for you after graduate school? What happened for your career? What happened? Um, I was invited by my professor. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had the blessings of having these wonderful men uh, and women to, to sort of come into my life mm -hmm. at the right time. Mm -hmm. So when I was at Stanford, Stanford decided it's going to, it's going to hire some black uh, professors. And it hired uh, a, a brother named Cedric Clark who became Saeed Khatib, mm -hmm. and a brother named D. Philip McGee. And uh, these two brothers were like five years my senior. They were like old, old men. And so we immediately began to hang out together and to learn together. 
and uh, and, and Phil McGee uh, had gone to graduate school with this other brother named Luther Weems, who became Naeem Akbar. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so Saeed and myself and and Naeem and Phil McGee, we began to bond together to think about this question of psychology mm -hmm. and about black psychology in particular. And um, we even sort of organized ourselves in this rubric called SASI, it was something like the Society for the Advancement of, of African Science or something like that. But we, mm -hmm. we began to play around with it. And Said suggested that uh, he had been contacted by Reginald Jones. And Reginald Jones was thinking about uh, publishing a, a, a book on uh, edited text on black psychology, mm -hmm. and so I said, you should write an article. Now, I'm, I'm a graduate student here. I'm, 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 I'm at the mindset about how do I get my term paper done, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and how many references, you know, all that, that the crazy little mentality. And, and so, but Saeed saw something in me that said, you should write an article uh, for publication. And so I took that challenge because, you know, uh, uh, he really was inspirational in a strange way. Saeed would take your work and you spent a long time doing your, your papers and stuff and Sai would take a minute in his office, look at it, and go right to where it was weak and say, no, this is not good enough. And you said, oh, Lord, what am I going to do now? But he saw something in me that says, you should write, you should write for publication, particularly around uh, your interest. And my interest there was now, I'm, I'm coming out of this high school where I'm struggling and studying ancient, Afri ancient history, wondering where the African history was. Um, I'm going to, um, I, I, I was bred by a black woman who said there's something wrong about this, this psychiatric hospital trip, how to treat people, and now I'm at Stanford University mm -hmm. learning. So I've got all these sort of things coming together. Right. And, uh, and then I started my work at San Francisco State where my work as a student San Francisco State struggling and doing the political uh, 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 fighting about the black studies program and then having some black history courses as I was exiting San Francisco State. And, but then the black history was, early on for me, uh, insufficient. It wasn't just history. Mm -hmm. I always had the question, we don't wanna, I don't want to know black history. I wanted to know why we make history. Mm -hmm. And the question why we make history led me to the question of philosophy and culture. And so at Stanford now, I'm looking at, well, let's, what is African philosophy? And, uh, and how does that relate to psychology? Because I understood that the psychology with all those courses that forced me to take were, was grounded in some, somebody's Greek or Roman uh, uh, philosophy. So I said, well, the, what, Western psychology is grounded in Greek and Roman philosophy, and we're talking about a black psychology, what's the philosophy they should be grounded in? Mm -hmm. And so my first publication was to deal with African philosophy mm -hmm. as a foundation for, for black psychology. And I worked through that mm -hmm. in, 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 and had a publication uh, while these other students were jacking around about, I'm so glad to be at Stanford University. So now I'm on this, I'm on this trajectory, literally this path, of, I think, independent thinking. Mm -hmm. At least trying to have independent thinking about this thing called black psychology. And uh, so Said and, 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 and Phil and, and, uh, and myself and, and, and Naeem began to be a little quartet. <laughs> a little quartet. We'd go to conference, we'd present together, and mm -hmm. we'd, we'd debrief each other, and we'd decide, you know, this is what we, you, this is the area you needed to specialize in. And so, so Phil began to look at the question of physiological psychology and, melanin based thought and, and, and Naeem started looking at personality stuff and I was interested in identity as self-concept and, and, si and Sai was deal dealing with the whole question of uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we began to put some stuff together and, and end up writing our first uh, joint paper together. So, so things just sort of mm -hmm. came, uh, evolved out of our intimacy with community. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point I'm trying to make is that there's been a historical intimacy with community and, and love of black people that gets translated into this discipline called what one black studies in black psychology. For, for me, they were both being born in, in, in my reality at the same time, black studies in, in, in black psychology. And I think the contribution that, that uh, the, the, the folk that I was talking with mostly uh, provided was to take those, both those disciplines and make sure they're not just a reaction to white studies or a reaction to white psychology, and that we had to ground one African black studies in an African-centered foundation, and we had to ground black psychology not as a reaction to white psychology, but have its own grounding in the philosophy of African people. Mm -hmm. And that's been, that's been the nature of my work from the beginning to now. Wow.
So Dr. Noble's postgraduate school, when did... Well, I got a job. Yeah. You got a job. Yeah, Tell us job. about your job. Yeah, what did you do? <laughs> I got a job. Actually, uh, these, 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 these letter stuff were uh, uh, interesting. When I was finishing graduate school, uh, I saw the process. Mm -hmm. White professor would get in the office and call up somebody and say, hey, I got this kid coming out, you need, a, you need an interview. But when it came to me, I wasn't getting the white professors calling everybody saying, hey, we got a kid coming out. You, uh, you ought to think about hiring him. Mm -hmm. And so I sent out my resume to mostly historical black colleges and to this place in San Francisco called Westside Community Mental Health Center. And Westside is an important place that somebody at some point needs to talk with, with Harold Dent and, and, mm -hmm. and Bill Pierce and well, uh, uh, Bill Hayes is now transitioned, but there was a, a set of young brothers getting, we're, we're talking, I'm, they're like five or six years older than me, so it's not like these are old, these are men and I'm a child, but there was these young brothers who at Westside Community with the Health Center, and that was a time when, <coughs> excuse me, um, what's his name, uh, Jack Kennedy became mm -hmm. president, and Jack Kennedy had a, a, a sister who had, uh, was mentally retired or something, mm -hmm. and it's really, this is the reason why uh, Jack Kennedy started this whole community mental health initiative that established community mental health centers all over the country, but it was because he had a personal interest in this question of mental health. But in San Francisco, it was black, young black men and women who took control in this intimate relation with community. There was a strong community activist group, and, and some professionals came together and began to run um, uh, West Side Community Health Center. So I applied to West Side Community Health Center. I wanted to, I really wanted to, 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 to go to, uh, to be, uh, to go to uh, uh, Morehouse. That's one of the places I applied. And so I got this young wife, got this child. I'm one worried about getting employed and finding a job and paying my rent. And uh, and Westside came through, and, and Bill Hayes interviewed me for this job as a director of their Black Family Research Projects. And because they were, they were, they were really breaking the paradigms, the smash the paradigm of what a mental health center should do. It wasn't just about treatment, it was also about studying and developing, uh, developing uh, interventions. And so, uh, so, so Westside uh, offered me a position and I waited like a day or so hoping that uh, Morehouse and some of the black colleges would, 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 would respond to me. And because uh, I really wanted to go teach at a black university. And, uh, and then I said, no, I got to, I got to feed my family. Mm -hmm. uh, I accepted West Side's uh, offer, and the very next day, Morehouse offered me a position as wow. a professor there. But, I, 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 but you know, this for me, there was an in, something about integrity, and I couldn't just now go back and tell West Side I'm going to go to Morehouse because that's where I really wanted to go. But again, it's not, it was really sort of destiny because I wasn't supposed to go there. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to really begin to develop this line of, of, uh, of, of uh, applied black psychology working mm -hmm. in the community. And Westside gave me that that that, uh, that opportunity, but even at Westside, dealing with uh, dealing with the the, 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 the the constraints of just talking about black families and relationship to, to treatment, for me was limited. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at some point, I, I uh, uh, working with uh, Bill Hayes and, and and Tom Hilliard and Asa Hilliard and and uh, Pat Bell and myself, we formed a an independent uh, uh, consultant firm where we were going to try to do research and stuff, and, and uh, so I have this long, long line of, of, of history with uh, with a black psychologist trying to make a difference in terms of the black world, and that 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 uh, organization that we formed lasted you know, several years, and then finally I decided that I needed to uh, look at the larger questions of. Uh, of family, life, and culture, and then I started with uh, uh, Lawford Goddard and William Cavill, the Institute for the Advanced Study of Black Family Life and Culture, mm -hmm. and that has been the base of my work for the last 35 years in terms of the kinds of research, the kinds of analysis, the kinds of study. Even though I had my one foot in the university at San Francisco State, my real uh, intellectual uh, primer has been a community-based mm -hmm. organization where everything is is filtered through that intimate relationship with community and not with the academics of the university. Mm -hmm. that, 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 I think I'm more shaped as a scholar, as an intellectual, because I have a day-to-day -day intimate relationship with community mm -hmm. in my work and not some of the artificiality right. that is associated with the academy. So Dr. Noble says 
we reflect on um, some of the struggles and the resiliency of the organization of ABCI, what are your hopes for the future of ABCI? What things should we be looking at? How do we grow? Where do we go from here? I think that, and I was thinking about this uh, since the convention started, that, that we're 40 years old, yeah. but we might not be grown. Hmm. Uh, and that, <laughs> and that uh, ABCI has to begin to see itself as, as a, a full-grown being mm -hmm. and a full-grown being means that you understand what is your purpose and what is your intent and having the will to make your intentionality a reality mm -hmm. right? and I think what we're doing is we're still struggling with uh, and, and from my position from my perspective some um, insecurity about the authenticity of a independent, authentic black psychology. We, are, we as a body are still having that internal, that's, and that's, the, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing, but I'm hoping that we get beyond that and we begin to talk about uh, this field. See, we, we, we've created a field. We've created an academic discipline and we've created a field called black psychology. And, 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 and from my part of this uh, birth, I think we are also uh, seeing that this field is really an African uh, psychology, mm -hmm. and so I would hope that uh, that it, that as we recognize that we're 40, but we ain't grown, that we will hmm. we, we will become grown once we give ourselves an understanding, a full understanding of what it means to be African. Mm -hmm. Because again, from my own work, what it means to be African is to be human, and and that and that our question here is not black psychology in reaction to white psychology or African psychology to sort of this cultural expression of, of some interesting stuff, but that we have to take the authority for defining the meaning of being human for all of humanity. Hmm. That's the destiny of black psychology. And or, or what I would say is African psychology or my work, I'm, uh, this whole notion of Saku, uh, the illumination of the spirit that, 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 that we take seriously and have some debate, some discourse around this question of us being a divine, we being, humans being divine beings having a human experience. And that human experience could have a whole range of things that we struggle with, from oppression to unbelievable achievement. But that's, a, that, that's, that's, the, that's the expressions of events. What makes us human is our essence or our spirit. And so I would, I would hope that, and I know it's happening, because I say it even in our deliberations of this convention, that black psychologists we across the black psychologists begin to think more more profoundly mm -hmm. and translate those thoughts into program and action. Yeah. But we think more profoundly about what are we as the authority for defining what it means to be human for all of humanity. This is not just a black thing for black folk, mm -hmm. but we need to see ourselves as saying, here's what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And these are the kinds of conditions that human beings should not be forced to be in. Mm -hmm. And black psychologists or the associates of black psychology should be the vanguard literally yeah. in, in engaging in that conversation. I believe we need to take, we need to go beyond just we are we are a kind of division or, or component mm -hmm. of psychology, but flip the script and say, no, we are the we are the the inheritors and the and and, and the keepers of what it means to be human for all humanity mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and do our work, do our research, do our scholarship, do our practice that, that, that locates us as the authority for what it means to be human because historically we are, uh, African people are the original, uh, are, the, are the prototype of humanity. For 100,000 years there was nothing but African folk. Mm -hmm. we're, we're no other people. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to begin to talk about, take back that authority for talking about Here's the, here's the standard for being human. And, and ABCI should be, be on the leadership of helping other communities, other expressions, because I, I tell my students that, that what we are is spirit. And we're spirit having a human experience with an African face. And I, and I try to make my students think about that statement. I am a spirit having a human experience with an African face. So that African face is how other realities recognize me. Mm -hmm. So I can't deny that African face, but what's essential about me 
is that I am spirit. I am energy, I am power, I am force. And that energy and power and force is in every living thing in the universe. Mm -hmm. And so we are profoundly, profoundly um, amazing beings. But the, but the psychology that we've inherited so contains us and so limits us that we never see the full possibilities of who we are. Yeah. Black psychology has to help the world understand how profound it is to be a human being. That's what I see the future of black psychology. Thank you so much, Dr. Nobles. I just appreciate your interview, your time today. This is Leandra Clark at the ABC 40th Convention, and I just interviewed Dr. Wade Nobles. Thank you for tuning in.